Hello and welcome to Hardy Party of Five and a Half. Welcome. Rebecca, would you say that we're probably a sports family, right? Probably a sports family. Just a little bit. Mm -hmm. We were married on a softball field. That's kind of how we rekindled our romance. (laughs) Not really rekindled, but started. I was like, what? (laughs) That's where we noticed each other and then ended up getting married on the softball field. Mm -hmm. We've played softball forever. We still play when we have time to. Well, I try to still play. You still play. Yep. And I enjoy coaching baseball right now. Yeah, you do. You like just taking the reins. I do. Knocking those kids into shape. Them 12-year-old boys, they got it coming. That's right. (laughs) So sports has been a big part of our lives. We've had kids playing baseball and football. Jake just finished his senior year playing college football in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. So sports are a big deal in our family. And you can see our memorial behind us. We've got like baseballs. Is this the ball I caught? I think that's mine that I actually caught. Uh, Yours is over way here. later. Yours is over here, out of sight. Oh, I'm just kidding. It's got it's higher on a pedestal. Oh, okay. Your ball that Pudge Rodriguez hit that Cal Ripken signed. We Thank all you. know that story. Yes. And I was there with you. Right, and then years and years and years later, Many years later, you gosh. caught this ball right here. Yes. Yeah. Omar Vizquel hammered it barely over the fence before right. the game. And Let's don't it. forget that the only reason I wasn't out there catching a ball is because I was getting an autograph on a book for you from Josh Hamilton. Yes, you, you've you got some street cred. I do. You've got some sports street cred. Don't forget. That's right. <laughs> so we are totally excited to have someone from ESPN on. He yeah. worked for ESPN for almost 20 years yep. as a producer, and he's met everybody you can think of. He's worked on all the ESPN shows, Sports mm-hmm. Center, Mike and Mike everything outside the lines everything and now he's been doing a new thing called sports picture yep so we're going to learn about his history with espn and then we're going to see what he's doing now which is totally exciting it's so exciting yep so we hope that you enjoy this interview with jason romano having an empathetic heart it's about us being free we're the ones that are keeping ourselves in bondage and stuck not only a speaker he's an author he's a media consultant he's a church leader with over 20 years of professional broadcasting experience on both the regional and network level. For 17 years, he was uh, an Emmy award-winning producer, a senior manager at ESPN. Jason Romano, and the one thing I will say about him of the many that you could, he is the one thing in life that we need more of. He is a genuinely nice yes, person. Yes, he is. Created and produced content for shows such as Sports Center, Monday Night Football, Mike and Mike in the Morning, Sunday NFL Countdown, College Game Day, and MLB's All-Star Game, and many, many more. Can we give it up? Put your hands together. Big Forge Conference. Welcome to Jason Romano. Jason Romano, thank you for joining Hardy Party of Five and a Half. We're so excited to hear from you and hear your testimony and about your job. It sounds super fascinating, but let's get to know you a little bit first. You grew up in Albany, New York. Yes. And what was it like growing up there? And did you play sports? Yes, I played sports. I mean, it was it's actually a, a small town about 12 miles south of Albany called Ravena, R-A-V-E-N-A. And that's a village of about 2,000 people. So we grew up in a small town where everybody knew everybody. Um, I did play sports. I mean, I I grew up probably out of the womb thinking um, that sports was going to be a part of my life because my dad loved sports so much. I think my mom told me at two years old, my first word I ever said was basketball. Not not mom or dad or, you know, anything else that was basketball, apparently. So that tells me something, you know, when I think back. And uh, yeah, sports was a big part of my life growing up. I played it. Uh, as I got into my teen years, I, I mean, I watched it religiously from the time I was seven or eight years old, but I was the sports nerd. I mean, I had notebooks and kept stats and collected baseball cards and football cards and and posters on the wall, everything. Got the, the preview magazines. I mean, I was all in from probably like 10 years old. So, <laughs> Okay. Did you do the drafts with your friends and print out a we used to print out the list of the draft on a dot matrix printer. My friend would put this little <laughs> software together. Did you do all that? 
we we didn't do that um but we definitely talked about the the draft speaking you know probably the nfl draft is what you're talking about but yeah. what we did do was we were doing fantasy baseball in the late 1980s into early 1990 before there was ever fantasy baseball in fact yeah, yeah. We, we, we i think it was called rotisserie baseball it has nothing to do with the yeah. chicken uh, obviously but we were doing it and we had drafts and four or five guys and we were, were teenagers we were 16 17 years old and we were picking players and then having our teams and we would update them once a week when we get the newspaper with the the full stats of every player because there were no internet and you know every week there was you know changes because you couldn't do it every day right. uh, unless you really wanted to keep stats off the newspaper so uh yeah we were ahead of our time i guess in that <laughs> Doing fantasy baseball. It was baseball, not football, but fantasy baseball back in like the late 1980s. You were the OG fantasy baseball then. I don't know. I mean, it yeah. was just me and my brother and three other buddies from Ravina doing this in our own little area, but we were definitely ahead of the time, I think. So funny. Well, I think it's fun because just waiting on the news, it made it more of an event. Like you're anticipating, okay, how did my guy do? And how are my pictures doing? You didn't have, like, you could check every five seconds. Every five. You know? yeah, it helped me. Um, and that's why I still do fantasy football. I don't do baseball anymore today because it helps me almost intentionally keep tabs on the rest of the league. Yeah. So it, it makes me pay attention to teams that otherwise, not that I wouldn't care about them, but I, I just wouldn't focus as much. But if I have a player who's playing in this game, it, it, it piques my interest. That's why it's become so popular over these years, obviously. Yeah. Um, so even in you know, the 80s when I cared about every team, it felt like because I collected baseball cards and football cards. The fantasy part really helped kind of keep tabs on which baseball players were doing well. And I could, mm -hmm. I remember having Will Clark on my team with the Giants in 1989 and they went to the playoffs that year. And it's funny how my brain works because uh, I probably wouldn't have cared much about Will Clark because I was a New York Mets fan and all I cared about were how the Mets were doing. But because yeah. I had Will Clark on this rotisserie. I don't even know what we call the league, baseball league in 1989, I cared about Will Clark. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, funny. it's funny, and like the players you hate, like I think last season I ended up with Tom Brady, who I've never really cared for in general, just kind of yeah. tired of him, I guess, because he always wins. But I had to start him because he was doing so well. And it's like, okay, in a normal situation, I wouldn't be doing this. I want everybody to know. <laughs> so I have one rule. I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan, and I have one rule. I don't... Um, I try not to pick players that are on the Giants, the Eagles, or the Commanders, the Washington team, because they're the rivals of the Cowboys. And I don't want to have to have a reason to root <laughs> to root for those players every week, even if it benefits my fantasy team. I don't I don't want that. I don't want to watch the Eagles and have to root for their quarterback to do well if I'm a Cowboys fan. It's just yeah. sacrilegious, you know? Yeah, it's so. about sport, it's about sports integrity, isn't it? <laughs> you know? Yes. And I I, I always prioritize my teams that I've rooted for since I was little, a little kid over any kind of fantasy team or anything like that. That's always like a, a consolation prize, but I want my teams to win. I still root for them. I'm almost 50 years old and I still want them to win just like I did when I was eight years old. That's right. You two are cut from the same club. I know. I'm, I feel like we grew up together. Uh -huh. so, um, <laughs> so you're doing all the sports drafts and all that. When did you realize I'm probably not going to be an athlete and that you wanted to go into more broadcasting and be around yeah. sports but not in it necessarily yeah it was probably 16 when i was in 11th grade and you know for the most part up until 11th grade i had played and was a starter and kind of the main you know not the main player but one of the players on on whatever team i played on and when i got to 11th grade i made the varsity team in basketball and i love playing basketball but i was clearly not going to be playing much that year i was probably the 12th man on a 13 man team or the 11th man on a 12 man team i was right down there at the end and occasionally i'd get in and if it was a blowout at the end of the game and that was it and then i broke my ankle um oh. right around the new year i guess this was 1990 gosh and <laughs> broke my ankle and i realized you know what jason you're probably not going to be a professional athlete here or even a college athlete um for the most part but you can go into broadcasting and again that was easy to me because I had notebooks and stats and I was just so enthralled with everything about sports. Mm -hmm. So as I started thinking about college, I said, I think I want to go into this broadcasting thing. And my senior year was really the year in high school where I, I said, all right, this is what I want to do. 
you know, for the rest of my life type, type of deal. You know, what do you want to do when you grow up? I want to be the next Howard Cosell. That's kind of where my mindset was. And so I looked for colleges and I, I wished I knew more now that, about how it works with college than I did when I was in high school. I mean, I really didn't know a whole lot. So I was thinking community college somewhere in New York, it's cheap and affordable. And they had the, a really good two year broadcasting program. So that's what I did. Uh, I wished I could have taken a leap and gone, you know, somewhere further away or a better school just to experience that. But, you know, we did what we had to do at that time. And I'm glad I went where I went, went to a two year school, got my associates in broadcasting, then went back and got my four year degree a couple years later in broadcasting, yeah. which really set me up for, you know, the career I had. Yeah. So how did you end up at ESPN? As a sports junkie, this is like the most coveted job. So how, how did you end up at ESPN? Yeah, I had, it's funny, you know, when you're talking to me at 18 years old, and if you asked me, what, what's your dream job, Jason? I don't think I would have dreamed big enough to tell you ESPN. Uh, I really just didn't have that on my radar because I thought that's, that's like making the big leagues as a, you know, baseball player you know yeah. if you ask me my dream as a baseball player as a kid yeah you might say the big leagues but once you get more realistic you're like well maybe i could play baseball in college yeah you know uh maybe i'll get drafted like the next levels i never thought about espn um my dream job was to be the sports uh the sports reporter for news channel 13 wmyt in albany new york like that's the dream i had i'm like that's a cool job to be yeah. able to talk about sports and kind of do it in a local level uh espn didn't really come on the radar until a couple of years after i graduated college and i saw an opening on this website that had job openings back in the early days of websites and i just applied and they called me and said would you like to come to espn and interview for this job and i was almost like asking you know a little kid for candy would you like a piece of candy <laughs> oh no i don't need that yes of course i'm gonna say yes um so i went out there and interviewed and i didn't get the job and that was probably the best thing that could have happened to me because it gave me this experience of going to a place and confidence to say, okay, maybe someday I could end up at a place like this. Mm -hmm. But I was very content, very happy at working in the local radio station that I was working at at the time after college. But then the year 2000 happened and you know, you guys remember Y2K and how crazy everything oh, yeah. was that year. You thought everything was going to go away. Yeah, I thought it was over, right? When we hit 2000, the computers were going to blow up and our, it was the end of the world as we know it. Yeah, uh, That didn't happen. And a couple months later, that internet site that I was on, the job site, had the same job opening for the same exact position at ESPN. And, you know, this time I applied, they didn't call and say, would you like to come out and interview? They said, come out and interview because they had remembered me from a couple years earlier and I got the job. And, uh, I didn't know that that was going to happen. I didn't see it coming. I had just gotten married uh, to my still wife, Dawn, now, who I'm still married to 23 years later. And I remember when I told her about the job opening, she said, uh, is this a serious thing or are you just kind of doing this for fun because you're a sports fan? And I think she was not talking about the job. She was just talking about me going and interviewing. Yeah. And I said, no, I think this is serious. I said, any issues? And she's like, well, what does this even mean? I said, I don't know, but I'm assuming we'd have to move to Connecticut from New York. And she's like, well, let's cross those bridges when we have to, you know, when we come to them. And we came to them and it was, it was amazing. They made me an offer. Uh, I accepted it before I, you know, 100% confided in my wife about it, which is not a good <laughs> suggestion I have if you're trying to get a marriage started on the right foot. But thankfully, my wife knew that this was like beyond a dream job for me. Yeah. And, and so we didn't have kids yet at the time or anything like that. So we picked up and moved to Connecticut and we're still here 22 years later. Yeah. Yeah. So was that job, did you go straight to Mike and Mike in the morning? Was that the job? Or that was the first job I had was at ESPN radio at the time was a show called Mike and Mike, which was not around for more than I think seven or eight months at that time. It had just started. Yeah. And it was Mike Golick and Mike Greenberg, just like it was for 20 years. And yeah, it was. I didn't look at it as like this amazing opportunity to work on Mike and Mike at the time. I was just thankful I got to work on the morning show mm -hmm. and you know, I was booking guests for their, for their show each day. And that was like a, a new learning experience for me because I didn't have the greatest connections in the sports world yet. Yeah. Uh, I had a lot of connections outside and, you know, experience in booking. I knew how to call and, you know, try to persuade a guest to come on or whatever. 
Mm-hmm. But it was great. I mean, I, I didn't see at that time that that show would turn into what it turned into. Um, because at the time, it was just a radio show. And I mean that. There was no video. It was in a small you know, closet of a studio about the size of the room I'm in now. And that thing just evolved over the next four or five, six years. And then it went on TV and then it became this juggernaut. And then those guys were together for so long that they became legends, you know, in the broadcasting business. And I finished my career with Mike and Mike as well, which is funny. I bookended my 17 years at ESPN each, the first year and the last year working on Mike and Mike. A lot of people think I worked on Mike and Mike for 17 years. I only worked on their show for two years. It just happened to be the very first year and the very last year that I was on you know, at ESPN. So where, what were your jobs in between there? Yeah. So when I was hired, I was hired as a producer. It's funny. I tell people for 17 years at ESPN, I was a producer. That was the sort of general term of what I did for the entire time I was at ESPN. I was a behind the scenes guy. I I would book guests. I would produce content. I would edit. I would, um, you know, coordinate what we would talk about on certain shows. That's what a producer does. So when I was on Mike and Mike, I was their booker. Then I was at ESPN Radio for two more years, and I was what what they call a line producer. So I was the one who was in charge of the show and kind of the main producer of a show called Game Night on ESPN Radio. And then when I left, I went to television in 2003 and did nine years in television working on Outside the Lines, working oh, yeah. on Sports Center, working on First Take, working on a show called Sports Nation. So all of these shows, you know, for nine years, I was a producer, but I was I was mostly a booker, a talent producer is what the title was. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I had a hand in a lot of different areas uh, there, which was a lot of fun. And then my last five years, I was actually doing social and digital media as a social media director, which was this new thing 10 years ago. And uh, ESPN was just starting to incorporate social media people onto their shows. And I started our ESPN NFL social media content in 2012. Um, and then, like, like I said, I went back to Mike and Mike my last year and I was their social media director oh, wow. in 2016 and yeah. finished out my career there. So it was a lot of different jobs, but I, I usually tell people it was just being a producer, you know, and I yeah. worked on all the shows and all the different places that you would watch on television and want to be a part of. I was very lucky to be a part of all those shows. Yeah. So is there a sports celebrity moment or two that comes to mind that you're like, man, I can't believe that happened? There is a lot more than two, that's for sure. <laughs> um, but I'll give you a couple. So the first big one was when I met Daryl Strawberry. You know, I told you I was a Mets fan. Oh, yeah. Since 1983. And that was the year Strawberry came into the league. And I was nine years old and uh, just captivated by this new player for the Mets, number 18. And as he evolved into this superstar and the Mets were winning World Series in 1986 and, you know, I'm becoming a teenager and growing into my love of sports, Daryl Strawberry was one of my sports heroes. Him, Tony Dorsett and Larry Bird were my favorite athletes in those, you know, 12 to 17 year old range. So fast forward to 2009. And my job at the time as a talent producer was to book guests for our shows. And oftentimes we would find out that guests were available to come up to Bristol, to come to ESPN's headquarters. And we would put together a schedule of shows that they could be on. And we actually called it the ESPN car wash, what you put a player through. It has nothing to do with cars or water, but (laughs) it's what we called when you bring them to ESPN and you put him through a day of interviews on all of the different platforms that ESPN yeah. has. So I find out that Daryl Strawberry has got a new book out and his publicist calls me and said, would you ever want to have Daryl Strawberry come to ESPN <laughs> uh, to do a bunch of shows? And before I could even ask any of the other shows if they were even interested in talking to Daryl, I just said, yes, uh, I said, yes, we would be very interested when I was, yes, I, would be. Yeah. Yeah. I would be very interested in spending the day with Daryl strawberry. Thankfully, all the shows, when I reached out said yes. And we had Daryl on every show, Mike and Mike sports center, yeah. first take, name it. So when Daryl was coming to ESPN, I found out that he was coming by himself and that might not be a big deal to those listening. But for me, that was a very big deal because most guests that come to Bristol and to ESPN come with some sort of entourage, even if it's four or five people, some publicists, some PR people, whatever. But Daryl was coming by himself. We got him a car. The car brought him up from New York to 
Connecticut, dropped him off at ESPN. He gets out and it's just him. And I was as nervous as I may have ever been in 17 years because I was meeting my childhood hero. Mm -hmm. And I tried not to let him know that right away. Like I just wanted him to see me as Jason from ESPN, a guy who was there to do my job and, you know, spend time with him and, and serve him however I could. And what was fascinating to me was if you know Daryl Strawberry, he struck or Daryl's Strawberry's story, he struggled with alcohol and drugs and really had some some difficult seasons of life post baseball, even during his the end of his baseball career. Yeah. So we find ourselves at the cafeteria in between shows, just having a, a quick snack or a coffee or something. And he looks at me and he says, So tell me about you, Jason. And I'm thinking, there's no way Daryl Strawberry wants to know anything about me. <laughs> but I said, okay, well, you know, I'm this guy. I'm married. We have a daughter, Sarah. Um, I said, I grew up, you know, I don't know why I told him this, but I said, I grew up with a dad who was an alcoholic. And your story was always interesting to me because my dad struggled with, with addiction too for many years. And that led into a conversation that was about faith, addiction, love, brokenness, his dad was an alcoholic, Daryl was telling me. Uh, at the time, my dad was still really struggling uh, with his addiction. He's sober now, thankfully, but at the time it was bad. Mm -hmm. And so Daryl and I connected on a level that I totally did not see coming because I didn't even get to ask him in the whole day about like the 86 Mets. What was it like to be on right, that yeah. team? <laughs> I, you know, the 13 year old me wanted to just know about playing yeah. baseball with the Mets and the 40 year old me or whatever I was at the time, 36 year old me was meeting this guy who just wanted to connect on a level that was much different than just sports yeah. or baseball or even ESPN. And what's weird is after that, he stayed in touch. He gave me his number. Mm -hmm. I gave him my number, which is crazy. And he would just call randomly like twice or three times a year over the next three or four years. Wow. And I would see on my phone, Daryl Strawberry's calling. And I, I, I remember the very first time he called, I showed my phone to my wife and I said, look who's calling me. She goes, well, you better answer that. And so I'm like, I got, I got to answer the phone. So I answer the phone and it's Daryl. And he's just like, hey, Jason, how you doing? How's your dad? And wow. that's what he would ask me. Every single time he called, he would just ask me about my father. Yeah. And unfortunately for many years, I didn't have a good answer for him. And he just said, well, listen, I'm praying for him. You know, God's got a plan. I, I know he's going to answer your, your prayers and, um, you know, just know that I'm with you, buddy. And I'm thinking, I can't believe this guy is really doing this. Daryl Strawberry is calling me and checking up on me because of my father. It has nothing to do with me being a Mets fan. Right. Um, and it's pretty cool because, you know, I, I, for many years, I didn't see how ESPN could be like a platform to share my faith or to, to be a Christian in the workplace or anything like that. But you can't tell me God doesn't work out his plan perfectly in the weirdest ways sometimes. Like to put Daryl and me in the same place at the same time, to then have that relationship grow to the point where we're friends now. Yeah. Um, when I wrote my first book in 2017, 2016, I was writing it. I, uh, I asked him, would you be willing to be a part of this? And he said, yes. Uh, I'll do anything, whatever you need, Jason. And he agreed to write the forward to my book. Like, are you kidding me? So um, his name and my name are on the same book together. That's just nuts. Uh, but we've been able now to stay in touch and stay friends. And I've, I've interviewed him three or four times on my, my podcast now that I do. And um, I'm really grateful for that friendship. Mm -hmm. But that came out of nowhere. Like, I totally didn't. I was just hoping that I get to spend a day with my baseball hero. Yeah. And turned out to be a friendship that's lasted 13 years now, which is just that's nuts. Crazy. That's awesome. It's amazing how God can work in those when, and especially when we're not even expecting it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Out of nowhere. Yeah. Out of nowhere. And I, I just was so caught off guard, you know, by the fact that this man asked me for his number and that he followed through on it and stayed in touch. Mm -hmm. And that was the real deal. Like I'll go to bat for that guy, not you know, no pun intended, but I would go to bat for that guy. <laughs> every single day he might take some heat here or there whatever it is from fans or from outside people but that dude loves jesus in a way that i'm just so impressed with and uh i'm glad he's in my life it's yeah that's so great. cool that's amazing yeah. very cool well speaking of loving jesus can you tell us about your faith story like when did you become a believer and how did your walk with god start 
Yeah, I grew up going to, you know, church as a kid with my grandfather, going to Catholic church and um, St. Patrick's Church in Ravina, New York. And, you know, I went because I was being told if I go that we'll go get pizza and play video games after. And I'm like, all right, well, I'll do that. If this is what that means, you know, I'll do this to get that. Uh, I never really took my faith seriously or even had a faith. I mean, I made my first communion. I, I did my confirmation when I was 14 or 15. And I only did those because that's what you were supposed to do, I guess. And you're supposed to check a box and, you know, to be honest, my mom kind of made me do those things. And I'll never forget my mom after I made my confirmation, she goes, listen, I'm glad you did this. I will never ask you to go to church again if you don't want, but thank you for doing this. It was almost like this, this, I don't know, ritual that I had to perform to finish up my faith. I don't know, initiation or whatever you want to call it. And that was it. Yeah. And you know, I remember her saying that and I was like, well, I really don't have any interest in this faith thing. So I'm good. I won't be going to church anymore unless I'm absolutely forced to when I'm, you know, over the next maybe 13, 12, 13 years, I probably went to church on Christmas and Easter, maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, But that was it. And I didn't really care. Fast forward to 1998, my brother, Chris, who is three years younger than me, two and a half years younger, he gets saved and radically saved. Like he was headed down a pretty bad path and God got a hold of his life. And he turns around and He comes telling me, Jason, I I accepted Jesus into my life as my Lord and Savior. And I looked at him and I said, what are you, what's wrong with you? Like, are you now a religious nut or something? I really didn't know what that meant. Mm -hmm. Um, I was happy for him because he wasn't doing the same things he was doing before, but I thought he was in some sort of cult or something. I really did. I didn't know about the church and faith and other other than the, the sort of Catholic church background that I had grown up in. But then I watched my brother live his life over the next few years, and he loved his wife so well. He then had our our first, his first child, which is our first little Romano child of me and my brothers, um, my nephew Sam in 2000. And I watched how he loved his son, and I thought, well, that's attractive. Mm -hmm. I'd like to be like that, you know, when I get to be married and when I get to have kids. um, I didn't realize that was really stemming from this deep-rooted faith that he had he had uh, developed in his life. And so Mother's Day 2001, my brother invites me to come to his church. And you guys will laugh at this. I told you, I grew up in a Catholic church. Uh, My brother's church at the time was a charismatic Pentecostal church. Okay. A little bit different than Catholic. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not bashing either (laughs) sides here. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying one is over on this spectrum and the I other know. one the experience level is over on this spectrum. Sure. So it was an eye-opening experience to say the least to walk into that church and see praising and worshiping and clapping and hands up in the air and, you know, music and a pastor preaching. And even in some cases, people speaking in different languages, speaking in tongues. And I was like, this is, this is way out there for me. I don't need any of that. that he's in a cult. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much confirming everything I thought, right? But what happened was the pastor that day preached a message. And I don't remember what it was. I think I'm assuming it was on salvation. But it was at least interesting to me to listen to a pastor preach like that. Um, I remember that the priest had preached a homily that would be like five or 10 minutes, maybe even less in a, in a, in a Catholic church. And it might have been the only thing I was really interested in when I would go to the Catholic church. So the pastor preaching for 30 minutes was like, okay, I can listen to a guy speak about something for 30 minutes. So we went up back at my brother's house and he says to me, what did you think of the church? What'd you think of the setting? And I'm like, Chris, that was way out there for me. But I said, the pastor was okay. I said, that wasn't, that wasn't terrible. He goes, wait, you didn't, you didn't hate that. I was like, no, it was okay. It was all right. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if I understood it, but it was all right. And he said, well, come with me for a second. And, you know, he is at the time, he knew that he didn't want to force faith on me or anybody else because that was starting to push us away from him. I think he saw that, Mm -hmm. but he was bold enough that day to recognize that my heart was a little bit opened. And Mm -hmm. so he said, come to the back bedroom. And I, we walked to the back bedroom of his house. We sit at the foot of his bed and he just looks at me and he's like, I've been wanting to tell you this for a while. Would you be willing to hear, you know, about the gospel and about what Jesus has done? And I said, yeah, I said, this is your thing, but sure, I'll, I'll listen, let's let's hear it. And he, he shared the gospel with me. It probably was five or 10 minutes. 
He shared about salvation. He shared about the cross. He explained why Easter was such an important, you know, moment in, in terms of what our faith is. He explained that we were all born into sin, you know, what most Christians know. But for me at the time, it was very foreign. But mm -hmm. I guess it made sense because my heart was open enough to say yes. Because he asked me, he's like, do you, want, do you want this for your life? And I said, I think I do, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, there was a hidden agenda for me at this time because this was a year and a half after my wife and I got married and we were trying to have kids mm -hmm. uh, pretty quickly and unable to. And so we were battling some infertility issues and you know, going to see doctors and get treatments and all that. And I think in the back of my mind when I said yes to my brother, and I'm glad he did this, and I said this prayer and we prayed together, but I think I was really saying yes because I thought if I can get God on my side, mm -hmm. he'll give me the desires of my heart, which was to be a father. Yeah. And so that the the... I guess the MO or the meaning behind it wasn't real genuine. It was very much the genie in a bottle. Yes. That I was saying, you know, if I say yes, God will give me this, yeah. you know, it took me about nine months to a year to see that. First of all, we hadn't had our baby yet. My wife didn't get pregnant yet. So this genie thing wasn't quite working, you know, but then I, I really started to ask questions, read the Bible, pray and watch sermons. I was watching a lot of sermons on TV and I started to understand that that's not how God works. Um, yeah. Working on his timing. You know, if you read Ephesians 2, we are saved by grace through faith, not that anything that we can do. And so me asking God to, to you know, cut this deal with me <laughs> wasn't going to quite work, right? This deal of you give me a kid and I'll say yes to you. Yeah. So you know, I think it took about a year and that's when I got baptized about a year and a half later when I realized, okay, God, I'm giving my life to you, Jesus, I'm all in. And if you give us a child, great. If you don't, I'm still going to trust you because your plan is perfect. Mm -hmm. It's hard to say that when you're in the middle of going through this, this uh, sort of barren time of not being able to get pregnant. Um, it was about a year later, 2003, when my wife found out that she did get pregnant and uh, and Sarah was born in June of 2004 but I think by that time my heart was in the right place to realize that no and it was a hard one but no matter what was going to happen God still had to be the centerpiece of my life and on the throne as yeah. as Lord and King thankfully Sarah was born Sarah came in and that's the most emotional I've ever been was when when we found out Sarah or when we found out Dawn was pregnant and then when Sarah was born are the two probably most emotional days I've ever had in my entire life. And all of that stems back to the dad thing. My dad not being there, not being able to stop drinking and just some of this brokenness that I went through with him. My desire to be a dad was so strong because I wanted to give a child everything that I didn't have from my father. And yeah. so finally to be able to have that was incredible. And I, I think I never saw God more clearly um, than I did when I became a dad. And I, you know, you guys know when you have kids, like you see your kids and you're like, I love this kid no matter what. And they haven't even done anything <laughs> to sort of deserve that love yet. In fact, no. they do everything but because all they do is poop and eat and cry <laughs> and, and, yeah. and whine. And, and so it's like, but you love them no matter what unconditionally. And that's how God is with us. Like mm -hmm. to explain that to people is hard sometimes because we, so many of us um, strive for the approval of our parents or the approval of other people. Mm -hmm. And then when you become a dad, you say, okay, that kid can do anything they want, good, bad, or indifferent, and I'm not going to love them any different. That's God's love for us. So why can't we accept that love from God in the same way that we see how we love other, ki other people, mm -hmm. our own kids? And uh, it was just an eye opener for me. And that really took my faith to a place that yeah. was just really powerful. So. So can we go back to that Mother's Day and mm -hmm. you come home from church, you visit with your brother. Did Dawn go? She did not, weirdly okay, enough. So, so, so the wife and me needs to know, how how did Dawn get up to par here? This is a good question because at the, it was Mother's Day and at the time, my wife and I both agreed to kind of, she go see her mom, I go see my mom. It wasn't where we could kind of do the whole thing together. Mm -hmm. And we went back to Albany. Um, I went to my brother's church and my mom was there with me and my other brother was there with me too and then she went to spend that day with her mom and her dad and her sister and her brother 
So we, she wasn't there. So this is interesting because I remember when I came home and I told her, I said, I think I just became a Christian today. <laughs> and she goes, you mean like your brother? And I said, yeah. yeah. And she actually looked at me because we had both grown up Catholic and kind of got married in the Catholic church, but I would call us very nominal Christians who really didn't understand or care about faith much. Yeah. And she said, what do you mean? Like your brother? Um, so why do you need that? That's what she asked me. And oh, I said, wow. I, I don't know. And she's like, well, we have most of the things that we want. Like you're not doing the things that your brother was doing. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I even said that day. Well, it's because you're not pregnant yet. You're like, I don't know if I said that to her openly, yeah. but that was the answer. Yeah. Uh, but I just told her, I said, I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I'm going to see what this is about. I just feel like it was, it was for me. And it was, this is 2001. It wasn't until 2005 till my wife became a Christian herself. So there was four years there of me growing and learning and getting wow. baptized and finding a church. I mean, even to the point when I found the church in 2003 that I wanted to be a part of here in Connecticut that I'm still a part of today, I went there for the first year without my wife. Wow. Um, which is very, very hard to do. Yeah. But I, I knew that if I'm going to be this spiritual leader in my house, like I had to take care of that side of it first. And I would always leave church and come right home. You know, I wasn't building the community like I, I have done today at the church um, because I wanted to make sure that I was there for my wife as well and mm -hmm. have her understand, like, I still love you and I still have a priority of being as you know good a husband as I can, but I can't, I just can't um, neglect this side of me, this spiritual side that's growing and is hungering and thirsting for, for God. Mm -hmm. um, then I think when she got pregnant and Sarah was born, her eyes started to, to open and her heart started to soften to the miracle that our daughter really truly was. And it is, I mean, she's 18 now, but I tell her all the time, you're our miracle child, Sarah, because we prayed for you and didn't even know if you would come. Yeah. So I think my wife seeing that, I think softened her heart. And then meeting some of my friends at my church where they just loved her, they weren't trying to force faith on her or anything. Mm -hmm. um, that's what really, I think, softened her heart enough to say, okay, I'll, I'll try this church thing. And you know, then we dedicated our daughter uh, in our church in 2005. And by that time she was coming every week and yeah, it's been, a, it was a slow process for her where for yeah. me, it was a fairly quick thing. Right. It's been a slow process for her. I mean, yeah. even today, like I said, the fact that I'm talking to two of you, um, if you guys invited me and my wife to come on this show, I don't think you'd have a lot of success in her. <laughs> she doesn't want, she's not vocal. She's not, you know, the kind that gets behind a mic. You'll, you'll never see her up at the pulpit you know, sharing a message or even sharing anything about her testimony yeah. because it's just mm -hmm. not who she is. She's very private and very introverted. Yeah. Um, but I'm grateful that God brought her along on the journey that she's been on at her pace. Absolutely. You know, we talk about that a lot. Like you want to, God meets us where we're at and he met Dawn in a different place than he met me. Um, but together we've been able to kind of grow in this journey together in marriage, which you know, again was a different marriage when we first got married to where we are today. Yeah. But the biggest blessing out of all this was that her and I were able to be intentional about raising our daughter um, to be a follower of Christ, to be in the church. And now my daughter's in college and she's at this small Christian school getting discipled and growing in her faith and building a community with other Christians. And it's just, no. it, I, this is where I, I got emotional when I was sharing this recently with my job because my brother taking that leap of faith to bring me into the back bedroom of his house yeah. literally did this complete transition in my life to something that wasn't happening at that moment mm -hmm. and changed the trajectory of everything that potentially could happen yeah. between my life, my wife's life, my daughter's life, my potential grandkids' life, their kids. Yeah. You just don't know right. yeah. the, the, the ripple effects that that's going to have just by my brother saying, Jason, come come talk to me in the back bedroom of my house. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just crazy. Yeah. And I think a big thing in hearing your story is you read the scriptures yourself. And I think that's a big deal when we're on that journey is not to, to read it yourself and let the Holy Spirit work on you and let you think about it and dig into it and not just rely on what people say about it. Because mm -hmm. not, yeah, not everybody's using it the right way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to lie here. I mean, I, 
I, I was asking for a lot of help. Because oh, yeah, I definitely. And, 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 the, and the scriptures revealed what they revealed to me, but I needed my brother to answer a lot of questions. I needed yeah. his pastor to yeah. answer a lot of questions. Uh, I would watch pastors. And I don't even know if they were like biblically rooted pastors. I presume they were. I was just watching whatever was the televangelist on TV, mm-hmm. but it seemed like they were talking about Jesus and reading from the Bible. So I would watch them. I mean, I would take notes, you know, and all these things trying to understand and grow. And I think, you know, I'm still that way today. I, I got my my Bible right here next to me at my in my office. I got a notebook that I that I take <laughs> notes on and I write down every single morning when I'm home. And and so I'm still that way. But you know, none of us will ever have it hundred percent figured out. Oh, That's definitely. the beauty of the gospel. Right. But I'm not where I used to be. And, you know, the Holy Spirit definitely has revealed through scripture, you know, what these verses mean a lot more now than when we were little, you know, when we were baby Christians. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, but I needed help. And I think that's, that's a good reminder for anybody listening who might be newer in their faith. Like, don't try to do this thing on your own. Yeah. Uh, Cause it will, it will fall flat on your face because we're not built to do this thing on our own. We're built to do it with other people. And so seek wise counsel, seek, you know, if you're Timothy, seek a Paul in your life that can come and minister to you and, 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 and help you and mentor you. And then eventually you get to the point where you can minister and help others and disciple them. So it's, it's a pretty cool journey that it's been now 21 years later. I have a Bible teacher that I love. She says, God meets you right where you are and he refuses to leave you there. <laughs> and if he does leave you there, then something's wrong. Like, so, yeah. I don't, <laughs> honestly, I don't know if you've met God because and that's not that sounds a little harsh, but I really truly believe if you have an encounter with the with the risen Savior and you have an encounter with the Holy Spirit, you can't stand still. You can't stay where you are. Like mm-hmm. it's gonna change you. Yeah. And uh, and it definitely changed me. That's for sure. For sure. Okay. So how did an encounter with Tony Dungy change the trajectory of your career? So that's another moment, right? Like my brother in two thousand one. Tony Dungy in 2010, and I told you the Daryl Strawberry story, so I won't have to give the full background on what the car wash is or yeah. bringing somebody to ESPN, but that's what happened. Tony Dungy in 2010 was coming to ESPN, uh, and we found ourselves in the green room at ESPN, just hanging out, a little conference room, while we're waiting for the next interview. And again, I don't understand why Tony Dungy or Daryl Strawberry would ever ask me about me, but yeah. they did. Like, this just shows who they are. And Tony says, Jason, you know, I understand you're a Christian. Tell me about your, your walk with Jesus. And, you know, maybe how do you live your faith out here at ESPN? And I'd never been asked that question before. And I've been a Christian for nine years at that point. And I'm like, how do I live my faith out at ESPN? I don't even think you can do that. Like I'm a producer at ESPN. How do I live? I can't preach a sermon or, you know, start baptizing people. Although that would have been kind of cool, but can't (laughs) baptize people, you know, at, ESPN in the studios of Bristol, Connecticut. But when I said that to him and I said, coach, I don't even know if you can do that. You know, Jessica, his assistant saw and heard this and she's a good friend of mine and kind of knew me well enough to jump in, but she, she put her hands on her hips and jumped in front of coach before he could even respond and said, Jason, don't you understand what coach is asking you? Hmm. And I, said, I, I, I don't, I said, I, I guess I don't because I, if I had to go and share my faith in the workplace, it means I would probably have to go work for a church Mm -hmm. or for a Christian organization of some sort. And she's like, no, look where you are. Like, look at all the different people that you come in contact with every single day. You might be the only Jesus that they see each and every day Mm -hmm. until God calls you away. And maybe he will someday. You are to bloom where you're planted right here at at ESPN. Mm -hmm. Uh, That stuck with me so much that I put it as chapter two of my second book because and I wanted it to be the title of the book, if I'm being honest, bloom where you're planted to me meant God has you where he has you be who be where you are for him. And so it made me think, Oh wait, I can come to ESPN and live my faith out. Not by preaching, you know, a sermon or baptizing people, but I could love people really well. I could serve them really well. I could be there for them no matter what I could be excellent at my job which it talks about in Colossians and to do it, you know, heartily for the Lord and not just for man. And so there was all these things that I started to kind of have these light bulb moments with, and it all stemmed from coach Dungy asking that question. Yeah. And I'll tell you what changed is 
from that moment on, over the course of the next few months, I started to realize that I was a follower of Christ who happened to be an ESPN producer. Mm. For the previous nine years, I was probably a ESPN producer who happened to be a husband, a dad, and a follower of Christ. Like mm. the producer at ESPN thing was where my identity was found. It's how I was known. It's who I thought I was. Everything flowed from that. But when Coach Dungy and Jessica shared that story with me and, and, and that question with me, it made me realize that I was a follower of Christ everywhere I went. So yeah. if when I go to the gas station or the grocery store, or if I go on a vacation and I meet someone in the coffee shop or wherever, I'm a follower of Christ first who happens to be whatever I am at that moment. Yeah. So it changed everything because it allowed me to see my job in a much different light, in a much purposeful light and allowed me to go to work every day. And again, I failed at this quite a bit, but allowed me to go to work every day, understanding that God had me for a reason today. And what, what that reason was, I don't know, but mm -hmm. I could at least be, whatever that looks like, the hands and feet of Jesus, we hear about that. I could at least be that as best as possible each and every day when I went to work. Yeah. To be intentional yeah. about it instead of it being an afterthought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to, to know that, <clears throat> I mean, I, I wasn't going up and talking to people about Jesus every day. Very rarely did I actually do that, to be honest with you. I just kind of lived my life in a way that served others. I mean, Jesus in Matthew 20 talks about, I came to serve and not be served. Mm -hmm. And it's Jesus. And it's like, wait a minute. No, that's the whole point. We want to serve you, Jesus. And he's like, no, I came to serve you and give my life as a ransom for many. Mm -hmm. So if we took that as Christians into the workplace, we don't need to bring our Bibles and put a cross on our shirt to have an impact. Like we could just love people. And when you do that, I think what opens up is people then realize that you care for them. And if you genuinely care for them, you're going to develop a relationship with them. And what's going to lead to that, I think, is opportunities to then talk about your faith and maybe even go further and ask them to come to church or whatever that is. Mm -hmm. But all of that stems from starting by loving someone else really well, um, like Jesus. And by the way, doing your work well. I think if we're going to be Christians in the workplace, we can't be slacking uh, or, or falling to the wayside. Like we have to, to be the best version of ourselves that we can be at work, because I believe that's a really good witness for Jesus as well. Because mm -hmm. I don't think you're slacking, because is that not an Emmy behind your right shoulder there? <laughs> <laughs> that happens to be right behind you. That is an Emmy. It's the only yeah. one I have. Um, I, I, I leave it there well, because... We don't have any on our show, so... <laughs> I do. I have one. Uh, it's funny. I'll tell you a quick story about it. In 2005, Sports Center was nominated for the Emmy that year for oh. Best Daily Show. I had booked two guests the entire year on Sports Center. And I had booked most of the guests that I had booked that year were with a show called Outside the Lines. There was one other talent producer at ESPN, and her name was Melissa Jacobs. And Melissa was the primary booker on Sports Center, But because there were only two of us, when they submitted the Emmy Award with the staff, and there was like 45 people who had contributed to Sports Center that year, they put my name on it along with Melissa's. And so then I found out they won. And I was like, oh, that's nice. I don't know what that means. And about six months later, I get a call to report to one of the coordinating producers offices. And I thought I was like in trouble going to the principal's office here. Yeah. I get there and there's a big box. He pulls it out. He goes, this is yours. I said, what is this? He goes, this is your Emmy. And I opened it up and it's that Emmy. And I said, yeah. wait a minute, this has my name on it. Best studio show daily, Jason Romano producer, 2005. I said, holy cow, how in the world did I get this? This is a real life, like that thing is about you know, 15, 20 pounds, whatever it is. Yeah. And it's a great illustration for salvation, by the way, because I did nothing to earn that. And that <laughs> freely given to me and I accept it and receive it Yeah. with all the grace I can receive it with. That's I've used that multiple times to talk to teenagers about salvation in Christ. Like there is nothing you have to do to earn your way into heaven with God. Like he offers this freely as a gift and all you got to do is receive it. So that's the Emmy story because I wish I could tell you, yeah, I worked so hard for that thing. And I was rewarded for the 50 guests that I booked and the shows that were just on. I didn't really do anything for it, but yeah, yeah. got my name on it. And I don't ever, I always tell people, I don't need a resume anymore. I just kind of show them the Emmy and say, yeah, just bring the Emmy with you. Just Here's my resume. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's awesome. Well, but, tell us about the work you're doing now. You're no longer at ESPN. You're at Sports Spectrum. So tell us about Sports Spectrum. Yeah, I left ESPN five and a half years ago in 2017 to, um, I don't know, just follow a call in my life. You know, I, I felt that call a little bit when I was with Tony Dungy way back in 2010, but that really didn't manifest itself until about 2015 when I started thinking about, you know, I was 41 or 42 at the time, and I'm like, all right, God, where do you want me to be? Where do you want me to go? Uh, is this, you know, I started thinking about the future, right? Like, do you want me to stay at ESPN? Or do you want me to do something else? Because I kept thinking that I think God wants me to do more for him. I didn't know what that meant. Might have just meant volunteering more, or serving more. But I always felt like it had something to do with my job. And two years later, Sports Spectrum came along. It's a sports and faith ministry, but it's media. And it's telling stories of sports, just like I've been doing for so many years, but keeping Christ in the conversation of sports. And that was really appealing to me at that point because yeah. I was growing in my faith. And suddenly I'm like, wait a minute, you're going to give me an opportunity to tell these sports stories that I so love to tell, but also preach the gospel through yeah. the same stories? Uh, what's that look like? And here's what it looked like. It looked like the 40% pay cut. It looked like uh, <laughs> no benefits. It looked like a contract position, and it looked like a lot more travel to go to Denver because I wasn't going to move uh, initially from here in Connecticut with our daughter in school. And we talked through it. It was a lot of prayer. It was a lot of trusting and believing that this was from God and not from me. Uh, my wife, you always ask about the wife. That was a tough one for her initially because we're cutting 40% of our income. Mm, yeah. But I just told her, I said, if this is from God, he'll provide and he'll see us through. And if it's not from God, yeah, it'll fall apart quickly and I'll probably end up back at ESPN. In fact, I was just reading in Acts this morning and Acts has a great verse. I think it's in Acts 5. I'm going to bring it up here because I've been thinking about it all today. And there's a moment where it says in Acts 5, 38, for if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it. Mm. And I'm reading this and I'm like, that's my, I read it this morning. I'm like, that's my story because yeah. I just said to Dawn, I'm like, if this is from God, ain't nothing going to be able to stop it anyways. He'll take care of this. Mm -hmm. And I'm still there five and a half years later. So that tells you that it's definitely been from God. And, you know, what I get to do now is some of the things that I dreamed about doing in college that I never got to do at ESPN, which was host. Uh, I had never dreamed of hosting a podcast once I got to ESPN or a show because I just thought I would always be a producer. And I love producing. I do. I still produce. But I also love this new thing that I've been doing the last five years where I get to interview mm -hmm. coaches and athletes and other people in the world of sports and ask them about their faith. Um, we've turned the podcast into, you know, articles on the website and our quarterly magazine that we have out that's been around for a while. And the beautiful thing about Sports Spectrum is it came out in 1985. So I was 11 years old when that happened. And you know, I'm standing on the shoulders of people who had this idea so many years ago that now we get to kind of steward this right now where we are and someday be able to hopefully hand it off to somebody else to continue as well. But the idea of being able to come into the 20, 20 22 year or whatever it is, 21st century and be able to, you know, adapt to the new digital form of technology with podcasts and website and still have our magazine and just be able to tell these stories. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, it's wonderful that, that I get to be a part of it. It's very humbling. Um, you know, I, I mentioned about our team. We have a team of three people, four people that really work on sports spectrum and 15 that are a part of the overarching ministry of our team. And, um, I mean, we pray every Thursday. There's, it's literally on our calendar for 45 minutes to just get together as a team and pray. Like, who does that? Yeah. You know, I don't do that in my job at ESPN. Um, or that would have had to be something really on the side that I would do intentionally. But this is part of our DNA of our team. Yeah. And I am, it's funny, people will ask, you know, do you ever envision leaving Sports Spectrum? And I'm like, I don't. I mean, if God calls me somewhere else, I, I want to go because I want to be obedient to God. But I really believe right now that this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. Uh, I'll be 50 next year. So I don't know what my fifties are going to look like, but <laughs> I'm grateful where I am right now at 49 and being able to do this job. And I hope I get to do it for many more years. Yeah. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, I want to take you back. You mentioned that your dad was an alcoholic and mine was too. 
Yeah. For gosh, into my thirties, I guess he was. Same. So, yeah. Yeah. So take us, you wrote a book about forgiveness. So tell us how that forgiveness happened with your dad and just how you process that. Cause I think a lot of people go through similar situations and they're not sure how to forgive or what, what that entails. Mm -hmm. So how, how was that for you? Well, it was hard. I'll tell you that it was also a long struggle. I mean, I grew up and from the time I was seven, eight, nine years old, I remember my dad was always drinking at that time. Yeah. Um, I didn't, you know, I was eight or eight or nine. I didn't see the effect of that on me too much until I got a little bit older into my teen years. Um, my dad would take me to the bar and he would give me quarters and buy me a soda and let me play pinball. Um, you know, or video games. And that was great for a, an eight year old. So I wasn't really paying attention to what he was doing up there at the bar drinking, but that affected everything in his life. You know, it affected two marriages, my mom and then my stepmom, Patty, like he ended up in divorces with both of them because of his drinking brokenness with me and my brothers, um, you know, that lasted into my thirties into pretty much almost 40 years old. Uh, you know, a broken relationship with his own parents, my grandparents, you know, loss of jobs, DUIs, in and out of rehabs, all of these things. Mm -hmm. So it was very hard. And I had carried a lot of bitterness with me all through those years. Uh, some of it I didn't even realize I had when I was a teen or my in my 20s, or maybe yeah. I, I knew I had it, but I thought I was justified. I'm justified to be angry because this is my own father who's not there for for his son, right? So you just carry that with you. And like I said earlier, wanting to become a dad myself, that was so important to me because what I didn't have from my dad, I wanted to be able to give to my own kid. And once Sarah was born, my daughter, and I looked at her and I'm like, how could anybody do anything like what my dad did to us? And I realized it was an addiction. It's a, it's a disease, but it's also a selfish choice that he made. You know, he chose all that over everything else. And then, you know, had to reap the benefits of that, unfortunately. So to this day, I've never drank. Um, I just didn't want to become my dad. I wanted to do everything to my daughter that my dad wasn't to me. But deep down, I was still bitter. Yeah. And, you know, as I got older into my 30s and I'm more established with my job and my daughter started to get older and, you know, I've been married now for 10, 15 years, I, I just thought that I was kind of justified with the bitterness that I had. I also threw a lot of that into a box and kind of stored it in the attic of my, of my memories and just tried not to think about it too much. Yeah. <clears throat> I was just trying to move on with my life. And, um, you know, my dad was kind of always like a roller coaster. He was up and down. He was sober. He was drunk. He was sober. He was drunk. Unfortunately, most of the times that I would have interactions with him, oftentimes on the phone, because I live in Connecticut and he lived in New York, were of him being intoxicated. And when he was drunk, he was not a good person. And I would get very angry and bitter when he would call drunk and I'd scream at him and it usually ended up in a, in a really bad place. And, you know, I dictated that a lot of that in my book because I wanted to be as transparent and open as possible about how bad the situation was getting both for him, but also for any relationships that he was trying to cultivate with me or my brothers. Mm -hmm. So it gets to 2013, 10 years ago almost. And, you know, he's at the lowest point. My dad also struggled with mental health issues and depression. Mm -hmm. Those last few years that he wasn't sober, 2011, 2012. And I don't know your dad's situation, but I will say when you add alcoholism and depression, it's kind of a bad combination. It's really yeah, bad. Schizophrenia and all those. Yeah, it just everything. You just add them. You, you put all that together and it's just it's just poison. Right. And right, so my right. dad got to his lowest point in 2013 where he tried to kill himself. He tried to end his life, took a bunch of pills. He was just done with life. Um, and to be honest with you, I was so bitter that I kind of thought that maybe that's a good thing. You know, that's how that's how demented. And I look back now and in, in terms of how bitter I was, I thought, you know, if he's gone, that actually would be better because all that's happening when he's around is, you know, negativity and chaos and anger. And it's not good. Um, obviously, that's not the, the right mindset to have, especially as a Christian. But that just shows you how much bitterness I had and how numb I was towards everything with him. But I get a call like a week later. My dad is you know, entered into the psych ward into E4, which is the floor at Albany Medical Center in the psych ward. And he calls me from there a week later after he tries to end his life. And 
I get on the phone with him and I hear this lifeless, empty voice who simply just said hello to me. He couldn't really say a whole lot more. And it was at that moment for the first time that I had empathy towards my father, mm -hmm. which I, I think when you're hurt and somebody does something to you, the last thing that is on your mind is having empathy or seeing it from the other person's point of view. You're just thinking about the pain that you know, you're experiencing. Uh, but at that moment, I heard his voice and I had empathy for him. And I just made a choice. I said, you know what, dad, I'm, I'm sorry with what you're going through. I want you to know you're going to, you're going to be okay. And, uh, you know, I forgive you. And I said those words. I don't know if I even knew what I was really saying at that moment, but I tell you something, the weight began to come off starting that day. I say that because forgiveness is not an instantaneous microwavable thing. It's a process that for me continues to this day, but I believe for those, and I have spoken in so many different places and heard so many different stories of people who've just, for me, at least it feels like they've been hurt way more than I've been hurt in their lives. Some terrible things that have happened to themselves or to their families. And they'll ask me, how am I supposed to forgive them? And I say, listen, I don't know how anyone can forgive anybody without the grace of God. Mm -hmm. um, but as I've done a lot more research now on forgiveness, especially in what the Bible says about it, and then written my book, and this is hard for a lot of people to hear, but it's kind of mandatory if you're a Christian to forgive. Mm -hmm. Jesus says that multiple times in the scriptures to forgive every single time mm -hmm. that you are wronged. So if he's telling us, and by the way, he also says, if you do not forgive, uh, my heavenly father will not forgive you. Mm -hmm. now, I'm not saying our salvation is predicated on forgiveness, but I think it is. And I'm not a biblical scholar. So somebody, you know, <laughs> reprimand me if I'm off here. It but sounds like it's pretty important to him for sure. Yeah. <laughs> let's just say that it's, yeah. it's pretty important to forgive every yeah. single time. And so when I preach now, and when I speak, I tell people, I completely hear you that you can't forgive or that you're going through something difficult or, and you have bitterness. I get it. Cause I have it too. Mm -hmm. I just know that I've never experienced more freedom in my life than after I finally was able to forgive my father yeah. because it allowed me to not carry this burden. Because what I found is when we don't forgive, we're the ones that are stuck in this bondage of bitterness. And when I forgave him, I realized it had nothing to do with what my dad had done to me for all these years. It had everything to do with me. Mm -hmm. And forgiving other people does not mean you're letting them off the hook. There's still consequences. My dad still reaps the benefits if you want to call him that, of the choices he's made mm -hmm. over the last, you know, 50 years of his life. He's 71 now. Yeah. He still has, you know, those, you know, lasting effects of what he did, but he's now sober. That's the, the crazy part of this story is my dad is still not a follower of Christ. So I hope people would pray for him for salvation. But my dad, all I ever prayed for, even when I was a Christian, was that he would just get sober. Yeah. And don't you know that last day when he entered that psych ward after he took those pills, that was the last time he's been drunk to this day. Wow. It's crazy. Like he got awesome. sober by getting on the, the proper um, mental health, you know, anti-depressant me depressant medicine. Mm -hmm. And that allowed his mind to see clearly. And he just saw himself where he was before. And he didn't want to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, he tried the AA thing and the, and the meetings and the, all the things that a lot of people, those things work for a lot of people. Yeah. But for him, it was just this medicine, this Zoloft medicine that he took and this mindset of, I don't want to be where I was before. Right. And now he's going on a decade of being sober, which is just incredible when you think yeah, about awesome. it. Yeah. Uh, and I'm grateful he's not where he was anymore. I'm grateful he's sober, but I still pray for him because, mm -hmm. um, you know, I want to see him come to Christ and I believe hopefully someday he will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's his name? His name is Joe, Joe Romano. Yeah. yeah, so Scott's dad had a similar type of history almost exactly. Yeah, in a lot of respects. In a lot of respects, almost exactly. And then at 71, wasn't he 71? He was 70 when he came to Christ. He was in a mental hospital. Wow. Yeah. He was in a mental hospital. And he, his Scott's mom walked in and said, his dad said, do you see what that guy's watching on that TV? Do you see what he's talking about? I need that. Well, it was a Billy Graham, it was Billy Graham. TV show. Wow. He so said, then my mom yeah. called and said, your dad wants to talk to you. So we were heading out of town, I think to Oklahoma City. Yeah. Because we go to Oklahoma all the time. 
And on oh, the way, on the, you know, Columbia City, we just drove and I stopped by and he accepted Christ that night. He was, yeah. After after so many years, just like your just like dad, yours. just 50 years of just yeah. crazy. That's encouraging. That's encouraging to me because, you yeah. know, there are, there are moments even today. I'm just, I'm glad he's sober, but there are certainly moments where I'm kind of like, you know, this isn't going to happen. You know, and that's just doubt creeping in. That's the enemy. I get it. Yeah. Um, I stand on the foundation of Christ and believe that my dad is going to, is going to come to know him. But there are moments I think, you know, especially with our family members, mm-hmm. when many, the years go by and you're just like, I don't think this is going to ever happen. Right. You know, yeah, it's literally really going to take an act of God right, to do it. Yeah. Um, but that story gives me hope, Scott, that your yeah. dad is, um, you know, is going to be with Christ now. And that's, yeah. yeah. And then he, awesome. passed, he, he passed away just about like, a year later. Yeah. yeah. Not even that same. Right. Yeah. Wow. Well, that, that's, that's encouraging though, because that's got to, I mean, imagine if he hadn't, you know, and I mean, we wrestle with all that with any of our family members that might pass on and you're not sure where they are. Like that's a, it's much more comforting to know for sure that he made that decision. And right. uh, I'm praying that that'll happen with my dad too. Yeah. So. We'll be praying. For yeah. Joe we definitely will be also. Yeah. Be great. Jason, I could sit and talk to you for another like six hours. Like I just want to hear more and more and more stories. And I love you. You just, your faith encourages my faith. And I appreciate that. You mm. take the time to share that with us today. Absolutely. And yeah. I know that you're a busy guy, so we're thankful for you. And I'm going to get this book because I think it's got a lot of good things to say in it. Right. We yeah. need to get both his books now. Yeah, yeah. that's right. And yeah, so- the other book isn't as deep. It's 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 more of a leadership lessons on my time at ESPN. That's more of the fun yeah, stuff. Yeah, it's, it's great. It's fun, but like live to forgive. I tell people it's the most important work I've ever done yeah. because yeah. Of my story. But I also wrote it because I want other people to be able to know what forgiveness can do for them. Yeah, uh, and it's not something I ever wanted to do or plan to do. That that I- wasn't in the, in the you know when I was going to college. It wasn't like you know what I'm going to write a story, write a book. <laughs> about all the crap that I went through with my dad. It's going to help someone else. No, that wasn't even on the radar. So yeah, that's great. this has been awesome talking to you guys. Yeah. I'm, I'm, let's you. do part two. If you want more questions, let's just come let's on. Do yeah, exactly. yeah, let's do part two. And Scott Hardy's written a little book called Trophy of God's Grace, which was about like really the rep, the the restoration of our marriage honestly yeah. and we've been married for 30 years now and so um we would love to drop that in the mail to you if you want it all right let's do it we'll, ex- we'll do a book exchange, a book exchange. Yeah. Book, i'll send you live to forgive and and we'll we'll critique and you know share some feedback on each other's books yeah. that's that'd be awesome be great jason and thank you so much jason. again we'll be praying for joe and for you yes. uh, how to how to walk alongside him yeah that would be great thank you guys it was so good yeah. to be on with you I needed like 10 more hours with him. I know. So fascinating, right? Yes. I'm sure he's got 1,000 other stories we haven't heard yet. I know. So I'm down for a part two. We need, it just needs to become a series, basically. (laughs) That's right. He's our special guest. The Jason Romano show with Hardy Party of Five and a Half. I think, I think he would do it. Which is, what's cool is for all those years that he worked behind the camera being a producer. Yeah. And he's so natural in front of it. He's so natural. Like the voice and I mean, it's just like. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, I can do that all day long. Yes, so good. So we love this interview with him. I was just soaking up all the little bits and pieces, so much wisdom in it. Right. And we hope you guys literally listen to that with a pen and paper in hand. There's so many good things to write down. So we hope you enjoyed our interview with Jason Romano, Hardy Party of Five and a Half, over and out. We'll see you next time.